Uh, Adrian, are we going to get to Mars ever? I mean, the human body is not designed for going into Mars, but... I think from Cook to Marco Polo to Shackleton to Scott to all these things, there's this human drive to explore beyond our boundaries. What's changed now compared to the older days is, is I think, the ethics of it, you know? And people will say, why are we spending money, billions and billions, when there's so many problems on Earth? I think that's the greatest challenge. We have convincing public opinion. Well, that has been the question, obviously, when we were going to the moon, we were having exactly the same question, you know, these, these huge budgets and people saying, well, why aren't we spending it on hospitals? So that, that question's never going to go away. Um, so, Ethically, legally, we've still got a long way to go, as well as technologically, politically, physiologically, psychologically. We, you know, we, we, we're not there yet, are we? Yeah, I, mean, I would just say, I, I think it, it is a different... People ask me about a second space race or something. I think we're in a different uh, situation here now where there are commercial actors and, and individuals who have money and who are investing in this. But I don't think we can ignore... People don't like to hear this, but the first space race was really about politics. The United States thought about nuking the moon before they decided to land on it. Um, so, you know, it was really... It, it, uh, you, as much as people don't really like to hear this, politics is very much involved because money is involved and money follows politics. Exactly right. Right, we've got time for a, for a few questions. Who? Let's have a little look. Who's got some? Uh, the young lady there with uh, her, her hand up. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask Ia... Ia um, with, as you talked a lot about the psychology of the astronauts themselves. I was curious about whether as much study is being done into the psychology of the ground crew and mission control. Because if we're talking about relinquishing control and enabling astronauts to make decisions for themselves while they're traveling, that also involves a lot of relinquishing of control and a power dynamic shift between the ground crew and the mission crew. So I'm intrigued if there's any work being done on that. Uh, we know from uh, Russian mission control, which is called SUP, uh, is where the mission control takes everything that the crew might um, try to offload onto them. It is considered that it's better that they shout or complain or have conflicts with the ground crew than they have it in orbit because it's better to keep them to keep them distressed and um, get the valve open kind of going downwards. So there hasn't been studies per se but that's a very good point because the support team needs to be in good health to provide support. And it's, so that question actually tags on from what you were talking about because, a little bit, as you were saying, Adrian, as well, it ultimately comes back down to teamwork. And if you're going to Mars, you're not going to have the same connection with the ground crew as you would in low Earth orbit yeah. or even on the moon. <coughs> People Correct, are going to have to look after themselves. Yeah. Um, I have a question as well for you, I, very quickly, which is... <coughs> <clears throat> when we're in low Earth orbit, and even when we're in the moon, when we're on the moon, the Earth is still within our vision. We can still see home. And I wonder, as we travel further and further to Mars, and as the Earth regresses to nothing at all, the psychological effect that is going to have on us as, as our home completely vanishes. Yes. So the values do change. So what happens is that as the group um, changes its environment, as you would know, you're probably going to be better, more skilled. To, I, I can talk about it, but you've actually experienced it. So maybe you should. Yeah. 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 Can I just stand? Those quotes from astronauts is why I so relate to them. You know, I've been lucky enough to stand on the top, the bottom and the roof of the world. And your perspective of the world below changes immensely, hugely. And you just look at the, the, what we value down here, materialism, consumerism, conflict, just pales into insignificance. So I can relate to that. So, uh, yeah, that's my answer. Great. Um, another question. We've got front here. Hey, it's mostly for um, Dr. Whiteley. Um, you talk about the importance of the link back to the ground crew. But I was wondering if there's, once that's severed, is there any technology in development to help pick up mental distortions, which may naturally happen when a group of people are isolated in that way? Because at the moment, if, if the ground control's gone, there's no, nothing there apart from other human beings who will all be in the same situation and potentially distorted. It's a very good question, and this is exactly why we did the study with the European Space Agency. 
the, one of the monitoring tools that we're developing right now is voice analysis. And voice analysis is able to monitor people continuously because we do this all the time through communication. And we don't have to be in close contact. We sometimes could be on the surface and still communicating. We're sending videos, we're sending communication messages. And so we can learn a lot about the, from voice about people's um, emotional state. So that's our first clue. Thank Good you. question. Are we, um, I mean, psychologically, thank you. Psychologically, are we, are we, at a point where we could consider a Mars mission. We've done things like the Mars 500 analog mission, which happened in Russia, where we locked up a, uh, an international crew for, for 500 days, and no one killed each other. They, they, sort of, they, <laughs> they managed to get through it. But again, they had, presumably they had some kind of contact with the outside world. The, the, the degree of isolation going to Mars is something that we've never experienced before. Well, I think um, I feel a bit dwarfed because you know we've got an explorer here and I'm talking mm -hmm. about you know externally I have never been but to I'm the highs what, and I'm lows thinking, of that. I'm thinking from the, from, the, from the space agencies though like um, their, well, their point of view. I, I think we we are ready I think we're tackling with technical challenges I mean the, there wouldn't be a reason or an urge for us to go that far if we were not ready so the reason mm -hmm. we're preparing the technology is because we want to explore it um, I think we are ready psychologically. I would just add, I know this is a bit eccentric, but um, I think it also forces us to think about the link between Earth and Mars. So if, if there was a colony on Mars, who has that, who has the legal jurisdiction, voting, you know, there's such a distance. Do they become a separate entity or I don't know? Well, that's the thing. Presumably when we go to Mars, we're going to be there for a long time. It's not like we could just do a quick trip to the moon, we could imagine. Going to Mars, we're going to be there for months, years. We're going to need some kind of legal framework to keep, keep a colony in check, presumably. <laughs> Although we have, I mean, the, the Antarctic, um, Concordia base in Antarctica, presumably just, just, you know, they have international rules apply. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, can I, yeah, I mean Antarctica is a prime example with, with Mars. I mean, we've, it's divided in the pie charts of like the slice of the pizza and the Chilean sector and the Argentinian. Bunk. Nobody owns Antarctica. Yeah. And as for owning uh, Mars, isn't Simon Cowell going to be part of it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, you know, Antarctica, sorry, but you can, you know, text somebody and it's right there. You know, when we're talking about Mars, there's going to be this time delay. So I think we have to... Uh, take into account the autonomy that, that a potential colony would need to have. We've got a hand up uh, white shirt there. I feel the need to ask when you sort of see examples of international law not really being sort of followed, you know, Russia takes Crimea, don't even need to start with Israel and Palestine, whatever. Do you really think in the sort of area where enforcement is not practical in the slightest that <laughs> there would even be sort of treaties to follow or sort of... <laughs> That's a really good question. I don't know, I mean... Sign all the treaties down here, but what are you actually going to do about it? It's a very, very, very fair question. I mean, one of the things we, we you know, those of us who study international relations knows is that there's no enforcement mechanism for international law. Um, my PhD was actually on why um, different countries adhere to outer space law. And it sounds a bit pie in the sky, and I don't want to think that I'm naive, but a lot of it is about their desire to be seen as legitimate. So even when countries violate um, international laws that relate to outer space, they do so within the wording and the context of the treaty itself. So I agree that it's not enforceable, but I do think that there are mechanisms that mean that countries do adhere to outer space law regimes as they exist. Uh, one more question. We've got. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, up there in the gallery. I haven't got my, my eyes on, but we've got some frantic people in the gallery. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, don't you think that uh, making outer space sort of like a neutral territory and uh, restricting it as much as possible, well, to the safe limits, would discourage private companies uh, progress through it? The mining laws are changing, aren't I they? Mean, They're slowly being chipped away because, like you say, private companies are wanting those mining I mean, rights. My, 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 my gut instinct to say that that is yes. And why is that a problem? I don't think companies should have a carte blanche to exploit outer space. That's my personal opinion, but I, I don't know. I know that's not... People like to think about outer space, but, I mean, 
we wouldn't say, oh, you can go to Antarctica or other, you know, the high seas, for example, and just take everything that you want. So why is the moon or Mars any different? I personally believe that there should be regulation. I think there should be restrictions. Even if it means that we'll be holding back commercial activity. But that's my personal opinion. With my sustainability hat, which is the three pillars of economy, society, and people, as long as we're driven by economic growth, um, we're going to have problems. But uh, people, planet, and profit, not just profit alone. One tiny question, because we've got to, we've got to wrap it up. There's a, a microphone to this area. I can see two hands. There's a, yes, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so you said that having virtual eyes and ears on Mars wasn't the same as boots on ground, mm -hmm. but do you think that it's worth it harming the environment, wasting resources, and possibly harm people, for harming people, sorry, for space travel if it isn't directly furthering scientific knowledge? Um, yes, I do. It's a really good question. There's always, it's a, and it's a very popular question. Why don't we just send robots if they can do all the scientific work? There is just, I would say personally, there is a human need to explore, and this is something that, that Adrian touched upon. Um, we've always wanted to push back horizons. We've always wanted to see what's around the next corner. And there is something very deep and profound about doing that. And if we can do it as sustainably and re as responsibly as possible, then hopefully even better. I think any science, however much it costs, if it helps the earth we live on, yeah. then it's a positive thing. And I think, I, I, as you showed... Yeah, you know, the, the pictures of space, when the moonshot, the first pictures of the Earth from come Apollo 8 came, it changed the way we, work, we looked in it. With social media, looking at the Earth from Mars, I think we'll all have a bit of a, a wow moment. That, that well, in fact, that, that Apollo 8 photograph, that Earthrise photograph, really actually started the environmental movement in the late 1960s. That, that photograph of the Earth changed everything. You know, they went to the moon, but they actually look back at the Earth. So I think science and exploration go hand in hand, but that's a great question. Thank and, you. And um, also the yes. UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency have a policy <laughs> to uh, apply all the technology that they use in space for Earth application. And that's exactly what we're doing with voice analysis. So at the moment, we're developing a program to prevent fatigue-related uh, accidents in the mining industry but the technology is currently being developed for exploration missions. So, and that's a trend that uh, ESA and UK Space Agency has always been very strong at, to make sure that there is a, a duplication, not no duplication, but also exploitation of the technology developed, benefiting us. Great, thank you. Um, we're out of time. Will you please put your hands together and thank our speakers, Jill, Ian, and Adrian. Thank you very much. Um,